exploring the modern message of the minor prophets, the modern message of the minor prophets. And so, so far we've looked at Amos, we've looked at Nahum, we've looked at Zephaniah um, last week, and we've looked at Hosea, and um, who else have we looked at? Micah, yes, we looked at Micah. And, and so today, as we continue the series, um, we are going to be looking at Joel. Now, I know some of you may say Joel, um, but I, I say Joel. <laughs> I hope that's okay with you. <laughs> Alright? Um, and so we're going to be exploring the, the message of the prophet Joel. Um, the name Joel means Yahweh is God. Right? The name Joel means Yahweh is God. And so there isn't much that we know about Joel except for the fact that it says right at the beginning of his message that he is the son of Pethuel. Aside from that, um, it is not known exactly when he delivered this message. Um, there are some speculations, and, and, there is, and there's also a, a few hundred year range of time that he could have presented this message. But um, the only thing that we know for sure is that his father's name is Pethuel. Um, the, the, the message of, of Joel, I, and I guess what, what's important to note here is that this, this message that Joel um, had from God is just as much relevant for us today as it was um, an important message for, for God's people back then. Uh, we see themes and ideas uh, that we have looked at and explored um, in other books that, in other of the minor prophets that we've looked at so far, being brought up in the message of Joel. And this, of course, is to be expected because even though the authors are different, there is one source of inspiration. Right? And so there should be no surprise that. You know, the, the messages between the minor prophets are, are quite similar. Um, it is said, however, that Joel um, read quite a bit of the other minor prophets. And you see quotes from other minor prophets included in his message um, here. And so, I mean, that sort of gives a little bit of an idea when he, if, if the assumption that, that he's, He's quoting from these other minor prophets is, is correct, then um, that would give us a little bit of an idea of when he, he is writing. And I, so, I think that that time range that is given um, is based on, on that. Uh, the, the message of Joel uh, begins with him lamenting. He's lamenting over the utter devastation done by an invasion of, of locusts, um, something that they had never experienced before, and you would see that being expressed in, in the, the first chapter of Joel. They had never experienced this, they had never seen anything like this. And so this, this was a desperate situation, right? It, it is said or, you know, that, that everything that was green was gone, right? After these, these locusts um, invaded the land. And so Joel saw this, this whole situation as God's judgment, um, leading him, as we would see in the, his message as well, leading him to call God's people... Um, and the people of the land um, to repentance. After repentance, we saw deliverance. Uh, we see Joel turning um, our attention after the, the, the call to repentance and the proclamation of deliverance. We see Joel turning our attention to a 
gift that the Lord says he will pour out on all people. So if you look with me at Joel chapter 2, and I want to look at verses 28 and 29. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. I'm sure this is a very familiar um, text to you. Um, and if it's not familiar, I'm sure you'll be very familiar with it by the time I'm done this message. And so it says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Today, I want to explore, I want to, to take a look at the, the question, um, who needs this gift? Who needs this gift and why? Right? Who needs this gift and why? Uh, let's, let's pray. Gracious, loving, merciful Father, what a privilege it is, dear Lord, to be able to gather this morning, um, both in person and virtually, um, to worship you. Uh, we ask, dear Father, that as we dive into your word at this time, that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts, dear Lord, and that as you speak to us, dear Lord, that our hearts will be open and ready and willing, dear Lord, to receive what you have to say to us. May your Holy Spirit, dear Lord, um, speak through me at this time, not my words, but your words, dear Lord, and I pray, dear Father, that as we hear from you today, that we would not just hear what you say, but that we would apply it to our lives. Thank you for being with us now. Thank you for speaking to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So as, as we explore this message from the prophet Joel, I want to, to zero in on, on what precedes uh, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all flesh. Because I, I think it's, it's important to know um, what happens before this happens. If we go back to Joel chapter 1, we see it being said in verses 13 and 14, we see Joel saying to, to the, the leaders of, of the church and of the land, he says, put on sackcloth and lament, O priests, wail, O ministers of the altar, go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because grain and offering, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Recognizing that, that the devastation left behind by, by the invasion of these locusts um, was the, recognizing that it was the judgment of God upon the land, possibly due to sin, the sin of God's people. Um, I think it's important to note that Joel first calls the spiritual leaders to repentance, right? The first people that he calls to repentance are the spiritual leaders, right? We, we see him there, the priests, the ministers of the altar, um, and then he tells them to call the leaders, the community leaders, leaders in the community, and all the people of the land. I, I've sometimes seen when we here on earth today, when we there's some sort of calamity um, in our communities or someplace 
um, on our planet. We often see some of these situations as opportunities to, to go and evangelize the people. Right? And nothing is wrong with evangelism. I mean, after all, that is what we, we are here to do, right? When God said to us and said to his people, go and make disciples of all nations, he's telling us to, to go evangelize. But that we see sometimes these, these situations, these disasters as opportunities to, to evangelize, to tell others that they need to repent and to give their lives to Christ that they need to connect with a church in their community, right? Not realizing at all that there is most likely a real need for us, the church, to get our act together first before trying to invite others to join us, right? Time and time again through scripture, we see God pronouncing judgments and instructing those judgments, um, instructing for those judgments to begin with God's people. Why? Because we see God's people being unrepentant. If we've got problems within our church family, let's, let's fix those problems first before we go trying to invite others into our, um, our undealt with dysfunction. Right? Let us fix ourselves before we invite others um, to join us in, in, in serving uh, um, God, in worship and, and so on, in fellowship. When Joel tells the, the spiritual leaders to call a fast and a solemn assembly, uh, which we see him doing more than once in, in his message here, um, he instructs them to gather everyone in the land into the house of the Lord. Right? We see Zephaniah giving the exact instructions when he called God's people to repentance. And we looked at this last Sabbath. Um, he says in Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, Gather together, yes, gather together, you shameless nation. Gather before judgment begins, before your time to repent is blown away like chaff. He says, act now before the fiery furnace of the Lord falls and the terrible day of the Lord's anger begins. Seek the Lord, all who are humble, and follow his commands. Seek to do what is right and to live humbly. Perhaps... Even yet, the Lord will protect you, protect you from his anger on that day of destruction. Now, I said this last week, and I, I will say it again. Now, during a global, a global call for, for isolation from each other, now, during this time of social and physical distancing, now, during widespread promotion of, of distrust in others for the sake of health, now is not the time to be promoting disunity in the church. While we may not all be able to come together physically, we can certainly be united uh, virtually. We can certainly be of one mind, be of one spirit working to God's one purpose for all of humanity. But let's, let's go back to repentance. The, the church must be unified in recognizing our need for repentance. Too often we allow our pride to get in the way. Um, too often we we are more focused on trying to prove to other denominations and to people around the world that we are right. And, and so when we get to that place, when we are able to, to get to that place to, to recognize the extent of our brokenness, um, our broken relationship with God and with each other, we must get, we must allow ourselves 
um, to wholeheartedly seek the Lord together in repentance. Right? And so that's the first thing that we see Joel here highlighting that, that takes place before, um, before the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is poured out upon, upon um, people, all people. The second thing that we see is that the deliverance of God's people from sin is really dependent on their willingness to sincerely repent. And, and God never refuses to deliver the one whose heart is truly repentant. After calling for repentance, we see God responding to their repentance by extending deliverance to the people of the land. And we, we see it's, it's a little bit, um, I like what I see here. He, he kind of highlights five things that, that happens in this process of deliverance. Right? The first thing we see in this act of deliverance um, is that it begins in the heart of God. Right? It begins in the heart of God. When we look at Joel 2 verse 18, if you want to go over there, we'll be in chapter 2 um, for a little bit. Joel 2 verse 18, it says, Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. We see deliverance beginning in the heart of God. After this, we see God sharing his heart with his people by letting them know how it is he intends to deliver them, how it is he intends to bless them. As we see in verses 19 and 20, uh, the Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you, and drive him into the parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea, and his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Right? So the first thing we see happening is that deliverance begins in the heart of God, and then we see God communicating his heart to the hearts of, the, of his people. Once this communication from God's heart to the heart of his people happens, um, he lets them know that they can rejoice because of the way he will bless them as he leads them to recover from the devastation as we see here in Joel. Right? He says in, in verses 21 to 23 in Joel chapter 2, says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green, and tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and the vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication, he has poured down for you abundant rain the early rain and the latter rain as before. We see him then continuing in verses 25 and 26, saying that I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never again be put to shame. We see him assuring here that he will make up for those years that were taken away from those people by the locusts followed by a, a reaffirming of, of their identity as God's people. He says in, in verse 27, You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. And my people 
will shall never again be put to shame. We see the gospel and we, we see, you know, parts of, of the New Testament, we see throughout the New Testament communicating a very similar message to us today. The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians uh, chapter 4 verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord um, always. Again, I will say, rejoice. And he says to us, he says this to, to God's people knowing that we have a God today whose heart is towards us, longing to save us all into his eternal kingdom. We see Joel then moving on to, to talk about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And as we just read in, in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, he desires for all of us to be saved. He extends to us this awesome gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says that after doing all these things, after calling you to repentance, after um, extending deliverance to you, after doing all these things, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days I will pour out my Spirit even on servants, men and women alike. This, this prophecy by Joel we see being fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. As we see Peter quoting this passage of scripture in his sermon, on that day, the results of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit showing great power in the early church, that the church today does not seem to be able to, to replicate, right? Is it, is it possible, is it possibly because we are wanting the end results without the willingness to take the required initial steps? Right? Are we allowing our pride to get in the way of our repentance? We are willing to accept the deliverance, but the deliverance comes as a result of a repentant heart. And so, what is stopping us as a church today from replicating, from, from showing uh, the similar um, experience of the, the early church. Peter also highlights the necessary steps, uh, this, the very same necessary steps in order to receive this gift. He says in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 to 39, in his message to, to the people then, he says, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Right? So we see Peter highlighting the very same, same steps. Repent, and then he says, be baptized in the name of, of Jesus Christ. Um, and he, then he says, you repent for deliverance from your sins. And then you will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, who did Peter say needs this gift? Every one of you is what it says in my Bible. Every one of you. Who did Joel say will receive this gift? All people. In other words, Every one of you. All people. So, 
How many of us need this gift? Every single one of us. Every single one of us need this gift. Not just the pastor of the church or the elders or the other leaders, but everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. Right? So what Peter said, everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. So, why, why do we even need the Holy Spirit? Why do we need the Holy Spirit? From my understanding, we need the Holy Spirit because no one can be saved without it. No one. No one can make it into the, heaven, into the heavenly kingdom without the Holy Spirit. We see John 3, 5. We see Jesus saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And I can quote many other passages from Scripture communicating this very same message. But I'll let you search for that on your own. Right? So far, the, the minor prophets that we have, have explored, I, I haven't seen where any prophet of God condemns sin or threatens judgment unless he also gives an invitation to repent and to experience deliverance. Right? I haven't seen that in any of the prophets that we've been exploring the last little while. While they didn't hesitate to cry out against evil, they were just as eager to proclaim God's graciousness and mercifulness and patience and kindness. In Joel 2, verse 32, we see it being said, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. My brothers and sisters, it's, it's hard these days to, to know whether or not uh, we'll be able to meet like we are meeting today. We don't know if we'll be able to do this next week. Right? It's hard to know what, what the future, future of, of our church looks like. We have no idea. Things could change tomorrow. It could change this afternoon. We have no idea. But despite all of the uncertainty that we are surrounded by, despite all the uncertainty around our entire world, I pray that we will be an Acts 2 church. Devoting ourselves to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to fellowship with one another, whether we are able to do that physically or virtually. Right? Also devoting ourselves to sincere and wholehearted worship of our Creator and our Redeemer. I pray that our service to those around us and our evangelism to the communities in, where, in which we worship and live uh, would be the results of, of love issued from a pure heart, a clear conscience, a sincere faith. The reality is that we will only experience this kind of church, the Acts 2 church, if we address our need for repentance. If we, we stop hiding all of our imperfections and we just be honest and real with ourselves about our dysfunction 
and if we would seek God for deliverance from all the baggage that we walk around with, God desires for us to be constantly filled with His Holy Spirit. We see Him, we, we, we see Jesus saying to us, Seek and you shall find, ask and it shall be given to you, knock and the door shall be opened. We see Him saying this in Luke 11, you know, how much more would your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? So, are we asking? And if we are asking, are we asking out of love for our Heavenly Father, out of, of, of a repentant heart? Because, again, as we just explored, the Holy Spirit comes after the repentance has happened after we have sought for deliverance and have received deliverance. Now, we see the, the, the deliverance beginning in the heart of God. Right? I have no doubt in my mind that the Spirit of God works on our hearts even before we repent. Right? Because the Spirit of God leads us to, to repentance. The Spirit of God leads us to, to, to seek after God. But for our day-to-day -day living, for the, the work that God calls us to do here on earth, we need the Spirit of God. We need God's power. And for too long, we, we have appeared to be godly, denying his power. And it's, it's time for that to change. It's time for us to, to, to stop pretending. It's time for us to stop trying to do it on our own. Right? It's time for us to, to surrender and it's time to us to call time for us to call upon him together. So that we all may experience the outpouring of His Holy Spirit individually and collectively. I pray that by the grace of God, that we will never again neglect to cry out to our God in the name of Jesus Christ together. Let us constantly humble ourselves before Him, seeking His power and His might, which is granted to us through the Holy Spirit, that His purpose would be accomplished in all of our lives and in our church for His name's praise, honor, and glory. This is my prayer for each and every one of us today. And for our church. I hope that this is your prayer as well. Dear Father, we are so thankful, dear God, that even while we've had our backs turned toward you, while we have ignored your pleas to us to to surrender to you, to, to call upon you, to seek your Holy Spirit, that you saw it fit there, God, to, to give us your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we might experience you. May, we may, may have hope. We may be able to, to experience your love and your kindness towards us and that we may be able to extend that love and kindness to, to those around us. Thank you for making that possible for us dear Lord. We understand from the message that you've prepared for us today dear Lord that you desire for us to come to you with repentant hearts. And I pray dear Father that wherever there are areas in our lives um, whatever is stopping us as a church, dear God, from 
experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that you, O oh God, will make it absolutely clear to us, and that we would, with willing hearts, come before you, dear God, ready and willing to, to repent and to seek deliverance from you, to seek your forgiveness. I pray, dear Father, that we all would humble ourselves and seek you together, individually. Thank you, O God, for speaking to us. And I pray, dear Father, that as we continue through the remainder of this Sabbath day, that we would meditate on what it is you have said to us here today. Thank you for being with us and for speaking to us in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, Redeemer.